Uh, greetings and salutations, Series 66 test takers. This is Dean Tinney coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas with uh, very popular content on the channel, which is uh, practice tests. Uh, shout out to Mimetrics, uh, their team, and Jordan for giving us uh, permission to explicate their uh, practice uh, test on the channel. They originally reached out to me uh, months ago. It took me months to get this permission, but uh, reached out for to me to review some materials for them, maybe write a review, you know, affiliate marketing. And I said, well, you know, I'm more interested in being able to do real-time you know, explication of your uh, tests on my channel than I am, you know, affiliate marketing and doing reviews. But I will do a review as we we progress. So uh, a little disappointed. I Again, I didn't do the affiliate deal, so I'm actually buying the content from them and then putting it up like I am now. Just bought this one. I'm rotating through the entire, you know, uh, content they have available. And uh, as I purchased this today and it popped up, it was only 50 questions. But hey, you know, it is what it is. They uh, said they're doing that to keep it brief in terms of their study guide. But all right, well, let's uh, get started. Let me see, uh, get my systems up and running here. And oh, there we go. And down and drag the pointer to the document just trying to figure out what the best way to do in terms of uh, marking this thing i think i'll just use my annotation tool to uh, mark it might slow us down a little bit but you know oh well all right uh which of the following is true which of the following is true uh regarding types of risk related to a client's portfolio the level on systematic risk will decrease as more securities are added to the portfolio uh, indeed, that sounds pretty damn good, right? I mean, on systematic risk is also known as selection risk. The easiest way to avoid it is diversify. You know, Bernard Baruch said money is like uh, manure, you know, spread it around, right? So that looks pretty good. Let's see what our other choices are, though. We always want to see if there's a better answer available to us. Uh, the level of systematic risk will decline as no, right? I, the, the risk prevails despite your diversification in terms of systematic risk. Uh, on systematic is uh, beta. No, beta is a measurement as compared to the market. Default risk is an example of systematic risk. No, again, it's not because you can uh, diversify and avoid default risk, right? Instead of buying one bond that defaults, you buy 10 of them. And again, you would have less likelihood that all 10 are going to go bankrupt. So the answer is uh, A, A. The Securities and Exchange Commission requires private foreign issuers to file which of the following? Which of the following? That's going to be a 20F. A 20F. The 10K is the annual report. That's the 11K is just the wrong answer, right? 20K is uh, nothing as well, right? In terms of the test. Uh, which statement regarding quick ratios and current ratios is true? Well, remember the quick ratio is the quick assets. So the quick, quick assets are the current assets uh, minus the inventory. That gives us quick assets. Current ratio is current assets divided by current liabilities. Quick ratio or acid test ratio is the quick assets divided by uh, current liabilities. All right, let's look at our answer set here. Uh, the current ratio measures a customer's long-term liquidity, while a quick ratio measures the company's short-term liability. Now, that's not true. They're both about short-term, right? So, you know, we have current assets, cash are things we plan to turn to cash within 12 months. We have uh, current liabilities, things we plan to pay within 12 months. So A is nonsensical. A company's quick ratio is more conservative uh, measurement than the current ratio indeed, right? Because we don't want to have to sell off our inventory to pay our bills. Because we have an inventory reduction sale, we might not get you know the kind of margin we need. So uh, B is the correct answer. In general, it's better for a company to have a lower quick ratio? No. I mean, it depends on the company about how much liquidity is going to be necessary. Uh, D, a company with a current ratio under one is like to receive, you know, if you got to listen, if you do this on your own personal financial situation, you come up with less than one to one, you better get your button gear because you're on your way to a severe liquidity crisis. Uh, four, uh, which statement regarding derivatives are true? Which statement regarding derivatives are too, true? A derivative derives its value from the underlying security. Indeed, it's an option, right? Options are derivatives. Uh, derivatives provide investors with an opportunity for hedging. Yes, 
you know, I can buy a put uh, to hedge my long stock position. I can buy a call to hedge my short stock position. So too is true. Uh, derivatives provide investors with an opportunity for leverage. Yeah. You know, if I buy an Apple 150 call contract of seven and Apple goes to 164, I double my money. Now, I would know the same supercharged speed that I'm going to make money with using leverage is the same supercharged speed I'm going to lose money with. Uh, a convertible bond is an example of a derivative security. Well, you know, that one's kind of interesting. You know, there's so many times they have these funky questions like this one. Let me think about that, right? I do think that's going to be true because, you know, the conversion uh, ratio and price, right, is going to move with the stock price. Otherwise, it's considered a busted convertible. Uh, yeah, I don't know why they would throw that one into the mix, but uh, the answer is uh, one, two, three, and four D. That was kind of interesting. All right. Uh, five, a futures contract. You get a couple of questions on uh, futures on the exam. Uh, specifies which of the following. You know, the reasons you want to use a futures contract. Uh, place of delivery, yes. Quality of the commodity, yes. Unit price, time of delivery, yeah. One, two, three, and four. And, you know, if you're not using a, for a futures contract, then it's going to be negotiated between the two parties and it's not going to be standardized and you're going to have contraparty risk. And so that would be the reason to be using the uh, contract. The contract, all that stuff is spelled out, right? So one... Two, three, and four. Uh, Tom believes the market is efficient. You are definitely going to get a couple of questions on efficient market hypothesis, uh, at which uh, at which any technical or fundamental analysis is already reflected in the price of the market. However, Tom also believes there is added value to insider information. I kind of like this question. So something does work. Something does work. Inside information. Uh, is not reflected immediately in price. Based on his beliefs, which form of the efficient market hypothesis, uh, that would be semi-strong. Semi because remember, if it was strong, that means nothing works. So the answer would be C, uh, semi-strong. You know, it's just a wrong answer for sure. With a fixed annuity, with a fixed annuity product, investment risk is... Well, you know, one of the things you want to do is compare a insurance product where the client does not assume the investment risk with a like variable annuity where they do, right? So in a fixed annuity, the insurance company is assuming the investment risk that they can't invest and make more than they promised you. Now, the uh, one I would be aware of on your test is an equity indexed annuity, and that's considered to be an insurance product as well because there's no negative reset. You can't lose money. So, uh, you know, be prepared for a question on that. Remember, variable annuity test question, it would lie with the insured, or in this case, not the insured, the annuitant. So fixed annuities, the uh, insurance company assumes the investment risk, variable annuity, the annuitant or the investor assumes the investment risk. And remember, variable annuities are kind of mutual funds with insurance wrappers, mutual funds with insurance wrappers. Well, here we go. So number eight. Uh, Theodore, age 62, owns a variable annuity. At the beginning of this year, he began receiving monthly payments, so he's annuitized. He is annuitized to supplement his income during retirement. Theodore wants to know the tax consequences of such payments. Well, remember, you're funding the variable annuity with after-tax money. So I'll just make up some real easy numbers. Theodore puts in a half a million. He's now got a million, right? So half of that money that's already had taxes paid on it. And what he owes taxes on is the money he hasn't paid uh, taxes on. So the exclusion ratio would be 50%, meaning if he gets a check for 4,000 each month, 2,000 he owes taxes on, 2,000 is money he's already paid taxes on. All right, eight, and a variable annuity was a qualified account such as an IRA, he would not owe any income tax. Then no, I mean, that's, I don't even know how you would think that would be correct. Since Theodore is over 59 and a half, he does not owe any income tax, no. That's when he can withdraw without penalty. Uh, Theodore's tax will be determined by using the exclusion ratio. There we go. Ding, 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 ding. Which establishes his cost base. His cost base is, is simply the, the money that he turned into the variable annuity, right? So the cost basis just means the money that you, uh, when you buy the stock or variable annuity, whatever the case may be. So the answer there is uh, C. Uh, 
Uh, number nine, uh, Amanda is considering purchasing uh, life insurance. Her risk tolerance is very low, so she wants a product with a guaranteed death benefit. That's important. Her main purpose for the insurance policy is to pay off her mortgage in the event of her premature death. There are 20 years remaining on her mortgage until it's paid off. She would like the lowest premiums possible for a policy that meets all of her needs. What type of insurance policy would do this? Well, the cheapest insurance policy is going to be term. Term insurance, right? So yeah, that's a whole mantra for a lot of people. You know, buy term and invest the difference. But, so boom, the answer is uh, B. Uh, which of the components of an option is not considered fixed? I like this one. Remember, the premium is set supply and demand. The expiration is, uh, you know, set in advance, right? It's the third Friday of the month, uh, exp expiry month at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. Strike is set. The size of the contract, 100. Yeah, so it's A. It's A. Uh, number 11. In a limited partnership, which statement best describes the exposure to liability for a general partner and a limited partner? Both limited and uh, general partners are liable for debts of the partnership. No, remember, only the general partner is liable. Limited partners are not. Only limited partners are liable? No. Limited partners are not liable for any debts incurred by the partnership. Now, you got to be careful on this one. I don't want to get too in the weeds, but you know there could be a recourse note or something like that. Uh, D, limited partners are liable for debts incurred by the partnership, but only to the extent, there we go, of their original investments. Uh, D is in dog. All the following are true regarding S-Corp. So you are going to get tested on business structures, whether it's a sole proprietorship, test question, easy to form, easy to dissolve whether it's a partnership with a flow through of the income and the losses, whether it's an S corp like this question with a maximum of a hundred shares, uh, shareholders, which none could be aliens, which also has a flow through, whether it's a LLC with a flow through, whether it's a um, uh, C corp where there is no flow through of the tax consequences. So you should be prepared for this uh, kind of a question. So S corps avoid double taxation by passing income uh, losses and deductions to individual shareholders. Well, no, the business takes the deductions. An S corp has one uh, may may have more than one class of stock, except right. So, the S corp does indeed avoid double taxation. You know, so right, it's flowing through to the shareholders. So A is true. Uh, B, no, no, no. There's going to be one class of stock. C. Individual shareholders pay taxes on the flow through. Yes, that's the whole point of the S corp. And so the tax consequences flow through, and then then be very testable. There may be no more than hundred shareholders. So uh, the answer here is B. Uh, you know, I'm a big believer in like a poor man's flashcard, and what you want to make sure is you don't take away the wrong information. So the point on the test is not that uh, you know B, and it's not accept. Really, what you need to know as a test taker, is that S-Corps avoid double taxation because of the flow through, that individual shareholders pay taxes on that flow through, and then as I mentioned, very testable, no more than 100 shareholders. So when you're studying, make sure you don't walk on to the wrong information, right? Uh, 13, the uh, maximum number of limited liability corporation is uh, D, there is no uh, max. You know, there's a question on the exam that says, you know, a husband and wife have a general partnership and uh, they have a family business. They own, uh, they're both general partners. And then they ask you on the exam why, why they might just uh, decide to dissolve the partnership and reorganize as an LLC. And you would say they go for the LLC because the limited liability, right, as compared to the actual partnership itself. Uh, 14, you are a financial advisor, an investment advisor representative meeting a new client for the first time. Which of the following are important and appropriate non-financial considerations? They do ask you about financial considerations, a number, 
and non-financial uh, uh, factors are not numbers. So I kind of like this one question. Yeah, this question. Values. Yeah, values can't be expressed on the customer's balance sheet or income statement. Attitude can't be expressed on the balance sheet or income statement of the customer. Their investment experience is not on the balance sheet or income statement of the customer. And demographics uh, is not on there. So one, two, three, and four. And again, that is uh, testable. Doo -doo -doo. You are a financial advisor, meeting a new client for the first time. The client would like to invest $100,000 in a mutual fund, but refuses to discuss some of his personal financial information, such as his tax situation or his existing investment. As a best practice, you should. So we have a know your customer rule. I say, hey, listen, for me to do a really good job for you over time, I need to know a lot about you. The more I know about you, the better I'm going to be do, uh, you know, determining suitability. So these are judgment questions. So we just got to use our best judgment to see what makes the most sense. I think judgment questions like this are, can be difficult. Uh, invest the client's money as they desire. Uh, place the trade and try to get the information from the client later. C, explain to the customer or client you cannot help them without an understanding of his current financial situation. Given this answer set, I think that's going to be the best answer, right? We have a know your customer obligation. Now, remember, be careful with these questions because if he's already a customer, he tells me to do something, then I say, aye, aye, and I do it, right? Uh, 16. Don't overdose, don't overdose on quantitative analysis as it relates to uh, the exam. I have a video called Analytical Methods as it goes into this. So the capital asset pricing model measures the return expected from an investment given. So I like this in terms of input and output. It's not, can you do the math? Nobody's asking you to do the math. We're just asking you to understand what it's based on. So does beta have something to do with that? It certainly does. You know, beta is a measurement of volatility as compared to the market as a whole. Does the risk free rate of return have something to do with that? Absolutely. Does the return of the overall market have something to do with that? Yes. Right. So one, two, and three. Uh, let's see, time horizon. Now, time horizon is about an investor and them getting to their goals in five or 10 or 15 years. So the answer here is one, two, and three. Let me get out my boom. You know, again, what you might want to do, I always suggest while you're watching these uh, videos that you have a notepad next to you or you have a four by six, six card so you can make your kind of flashcards, you know, and stuff like that. For a bond selling at a discount, here we need our teeter-totter, right? So the yield of maturity is going to be lower than the yield to call. Uh, yeah, if we make our teeter-totter, I'm doing a, spending a little more time because I told you I'm a little disappointed in our friends at Memetrics. This is only 50 questions. Uh, but, you know, here's our teeter-totter. If you don't know what the teeter-totter is, go into the playlist and find the Seesaw teeter-totter lecture. And, you know, the fulcrum of that teeter-totter is, let me just get a smaller font here, the nominal yield, and there's the current yield, there's the yield of maturity, and there's the yield to call. And so, indeed, the yield of maturity is going to be lower than the yield to call. Uh, a. You're going to get that. That's testable. You're going to get something like that. Now, the 66 assumes you have a 7. So, hopefully, you know, when you did this, your 7, you didn't just forget everything, right? So, <laughs> you know, you, you know, by the way, you know, don't just expect that you're going to go down to the 66. You know, I used to always joke with people about slaying their Series 7 dragon. And then I usually say, well, which is your next testing victory going to be? Is your next testing victory going to be a 63 or 66 or, you know, and people say, well, my next texting victory is going to be a 66. I go, well, be careful because it's a different dragon. Uh, 18, which of the following are considered active investment strategies? Uh, dollar cost averaging. Well, that's where you give me fixed dollars invested regularly. You end up with a lower average cost, the underlying shares, and it uh, doesn't guarantee a profit, but that's kind of an autopilot, particularly with a mutual fund, right? 
We're doing exactly what we should be doing, which is buying more shares when they're low and less shares when they're high. And uh, that is passive. Buy and hold is passive. Shouldn't be thinking about that. A rebalancing is part of a strategic asset allocation model. So that is not active. That's just putting our asset allocation back in place. So given this answer set, it's uh, four. Uh, this I, I like this rebalancing thing because that's, you know, that is testable and, and people mispractice questions like this. Rebalancing is part of a strategic investment plan where we're just putting our asset allocation model back in place. So it is uh, four only. And that tactical, so you know, strategic, long-term, tactical means that we're, you know, making decisions, moving money around. You know, uh, Lord John Maynard Keynes said money is like a giant floating crap game. And so we're moving the money around, hoping that we can cap capture the right sector at the right time or the right part of the business cycle, whatever the case may be. Uh, you should have definitely been able to eliminate A because you should definitely know if you believe in the efficient market hypothesis, you're not going to be doing active management, trying to get, uh, you know, a uh, higher return. Uh, support the strong form. Absolutely not. I uh, believe market contains inefficiencies. Yeah, right? Because that's why you're moving the money around to profit from that. So indeed, uh, support a passive management. I think you could have got this one right with what I call the Sesame Street trick. You know, one of these things is not like the other. Uh, which statements of dollar cost averaging is true? You will get tested on dollar cost averaging. Uh, fewer shares are purchased when the high price is high. That's true. More shares are purchased when the price is low. That's true. The investor may determine the set amount, whether it's $100 a month or $200 a month, and the timing monthly, quarterly. That's true. The investor could experience a lower average cost than the underlying shares. Indeed, one, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. 21, all the following are ways an investor can use leverage except. So borrowing on margin is certainly leverage. Purchasing a call is certainly leverage. Selling a put is leverage. You know, I would warn you the same supercharge speed you make money with using leverage is the same supercharge speed you lose money with. But D isn't about leverage. So the answer is uh, D, D. Uh, according to the Internal Revenue Ser Service, which transaction may be subject to the gift tax? Uh, Linda gives her old car and some old jewelry, all valued around $30,000 uh, to her neighbor. You know, one of the best ways to avoid the estate tax is to dissipate your state before the IRS gets their hands on it. So, you know, to prevent you from doing that, there's a gift tax. So husbands and wives, there's a, it doesn't count. The gift gift tax is way up there for husbands. You could just say husband and wife and toss it out. Uh, a grandparent pays 30000 directly to the University of Nevada for a granddaughter's tuition. No. Uh, Tom gives twenty five in cash as a charitable contribution to the American Red Cross. Uh, the answer is A. A. Uh, they don't like to go in there and actually change uh, stuff on the exam. I think the answer is A, by the way. At the end of this, I'll score this up. I told you I just bought it and I just put it up here because I'm I know how much you guys like uh, you know content. But if I do miss it, I'll put it in the uh, video description or make a comment uh, at the end. Uh, John would like to set up. John would like to set up an account for his minor child. Well, there's very much test questions about. Uniform Gift to Minors Act, Uniform Transfer to Minors Act. You know, one minor, one custodian per account, very testable. Kids tax ID number goes on the account. You know, no margin. So, you know, very, very testable. Uh, he would like to place these assets in the account. Stocks, bonds, real estate, royalty rights he receives from music he's composed. What type of account, what type of account would work on this thing? And what this question is getting at is that UTMA has more flexibility than does a UGMA, which is the old version of it. Uh, I don't really think this is uh, something you're going to have to worry about on the test. You just need to know all those things I just told you uh, about uh, the thing. So, you know, you can't do the royalties, for example, in an UGMA. Again, I wouldn't worry about that one. Uh, 
you definitely need to be able to current yield on the test. You definitely need to be able to do that. So a bond semi-annual, so they're kind of being jerks here. Semi-annual means 25, so that's $50, right? So $50, what it pays me, divided by what it costs me. Uh, market price, Andrew, for the bond's current yield. So the bond's current yield. They didn't ask you about his current yield. So we're going to divide that by the market price, which is 950. And we find out that the bond's current yield is 5.3. So tr kind of tricky here, giving you the semi-annual and telling you that, that Andrew purchased it at 970. So if they would have asked you what's Andrew's current yield, that would be a different answer. Uh, let's see. Boom. 5.3. Uh, you definitely, uh, you're not going to, listen, when people, I think, really get concerned about how much math is on the 66, there's not a lot. Uh, but current yield is certainly there and tax-free and taxable equivalent yields are certainly there. So, you know, don't get too hung up on all that quantitative analysis stuff. Uh, 25. Uh, Kathy purchases shares in two mutual funds. Fund A had an annual return of 10 and a beta of one and a half. Fund B had an annual return of 12 with a beta of 1.3. Which statement, which statement regarding Kathy's investments is true? Uh, fund A is a better investment because it has a higher risk-adjusted rate of return. Well, you know, remember one and a half means we're expecting it to be one and a half times as volatile as the underlying market. In fund B, we're expecting it to be 1.3 times volatile as the market. Uh, fund B is better because it has a higher risk-adjusted return uh, on that. Yeah, I, I don't like this question. On the test, uh, what you need to know is beta is a measurement of volatility uh, of the security or fund as compared to the market as a whole. And the way we would do this is just take 10 divided by 1.5, which is 6.66. And then we would take, uh, you know, the 12 divided by 1.3, get 9.23. And again, I just don't think that's really going to be a problem. What you're going to get uh, know have to know about beta is the volatility. And then what you're going to have to know is alpha would be the excess return, the excess return. Uh, 26. Which persons or entities are required to register with the SEC? So remember that what they're asking you here is which of these is an investment advisor? You know, the ABC test. Do you give investment advice? Do you tell people you're in the business of giving investment advice or do you want compensation? So an economic uh, professor who discusses asset allocation strategies with students. So remember, we have a, you know, a nice memory aid device called LATE, lawyers, accountant, teachers, and engineers. Uh, so no, a publisher of a bona fide newspaper that contains an investment advice column. No, this is a general circulation news, uh, newspaper and is a general circulation newspaper that has an investment advice column. Don't need to register. An advisor cancels only insurance companies. Uh, no. An advisor who gives advice only on U.S. government, government securities. So yeah, so none of these people, again, the exemption, the government securities are exempt, right? So it's D, none of the above. So it looks like we're transitioning here on the Momentrix exam from the investment component of your 66 into the legal and registration component of your 66. A registered investment buyer must file to blank to register with the SEC and file blank to cease operations. Well, we file, remember, to set up our investment advisory firm we file Form ADV Part 1 and 2. And to withdraw, we file Form ADVW. I like this question. You know, you don't get many aim and shoot point and click questions on 66. So anytime you get an aim and shoot point and click question, you certainly want to be able to answer that. Uh, the primary purpose of the SEC. Well, the SEC is God and state administrators think they are. So we have these 50 demi gods running around, right? The SEC has primary jurisdiction, interpretation, and enforcement of the domestic securities laws of the United States of America, and they are trying to protect the investing public. By the way, state administrators do the same thing. It's just they're doing it on the state level. So I'm coming to you from uh, Nevada. So as a retail investor in Nevada, 
Uh, you know, I'm protected by two, my state administrator and the SEC. Uh, 29. Uh, what securities are exempt from the registration requirements of the Securities and Exchange Commission? Now, remember, they're asking here about 33. They're not asking about the Uniform Securities Act. So uh, insurance contracts, yes, insurance contracts are not securities. Annuity contracts, it doesn't tell me it's a variable annuity, so I'll assume it's just annuity. Don't be bringing extra stuff into the, the question. Uh, yeah, commercial paper is exempt. Commercial paper is not being sold to retail investors. Commercial paper is being sold to money market fund managers who are capable of protecting their own assets. Uh, an interest date offering, that's a Rule 147. Now, be careful on that Rule 147, an interest date offering of securities. The answer here is D, but be careful. If this was a question about the Uniform Securities Act registration requirements, then we would have to register the 147 through qualification. So really make sure as a test taker that you're clear whether they're asking about registration under 33 or registration of the security under the Uniform Securities Act. Thirty. A registration statement must include a registration statement must include a description of the security. Yeah, you know, this is to help you make an informed decision, right? Information about management personnel, absolutely. Ending pending legislation against the issuing co corporation. I, I would prefer that say legal proceedings, but legislation would be true. But it, you know, the way we usually say it on the test is legal. Any legal litigation risk. Financial structure, absolutely. That would be a balance sheet and an income statement. Yeah, absolutely. So the answer is D. Uh, once an issuing company uh, submits its uh, registration statement, the SEC, that's, you know, S1, it begins its 20-day cooling off period or waiting period. It can distribute red herrings, yes, also known as preliminary prospectuses, which, you know, include pretty much everything you need to make an informed decision except the final offering price. Uh, obtain underwriters. Well, you know, I don't like that, but yeah, we already have our underwriters, but yes. Uh, solicit revocable offers from prospective uh, per purchasers. I don't like this question because, you know, revocable offers, that's called indications of interest, which are non-binding on all parties. That's not how they're going to say that on your actual exam. They're going to say indications of interest, which are non-binding. So solicit revocable offers. I just don't like the language, but, you know, uh, for Mometrics, I think that's going to be included. Let's see, I need one, two. Uh, so I got to take, if I take four, let's see, four I know. So if I'm taking one, two, and four, I got to take three. I don't like the phraseology, but I'll, you know, I'll take it. All the following are considered accredited investors except... Uh, I know you're excited. You're going to be considered an accredited investor based on your seven and being in good standing or uh, 65 in good standing. But uh, that's not certainly what you're going to see on the test. What you're going to see on the test is who can uh, participate or accept an invitation to participate in what's called a private placement, a Reg D offering. Now, the Reg D offering private placement I don't have to register that with the SEC under 33. And I also don't have to register Reg D under the Uniform Securities Act. So I think a good way to remember this is one, two, three, one, two, three. Do you have a million dollars net worth exclusive of your primary residence? Do you have uh, $200,000 in income for the last two years with the expectation of that this year? Are you married and filing jointly? And do you have 300? Now this says except... And so the annual income isn't 150. Remember, the annual income is 200. So it's going to be A. I wouldn't worry about the other ones here. I would know the million dollars. I would know the 200,000. And I would know the 300,000. Well, here's another question on Reg D. So it looks like our friends at Mometrics, maybe their exams aren't as random, perhaps, as the actual exam. Anyways, 33. All the following uh, transactions are exempt uh, under the SEC Reg D, except uh, issues less than a million and a half. Uh, the, 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 you know, the exemptions aren't based on, 
you know, uh, Reg D private placements. You know, you know, I don't like the million and a half. There's five million, but private company sales of less than 500 million in a 12 month period. Uh, private companies of less than five million in a 12 month period. Uh, private company sales of uh, five million in uh, terms of this. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of this one. Uh, I'm going to go for A because I'm thinking I would use a Reg A. Uh, I wouldn't worry about this at all. I would just know Reg D, we have to have accredited investors. And I would know the difference between 506B, where we can have up to 35 non-accredited and we can't solicit. And uh, Reg uh, 506C, where we can only have accredited investors, we can solicit or advertise. And then I would know, uh, you know, uh, Reg A is another exemption where we can sell the public based and can't raise more than 75 million. So not a big fan. This is, a, I think, a, the worst question so far from our friends at Momentrix. Um, the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934. So, you know, you can get uh, questions right by covering up the screen. Are they asking about 33 or 34? 33 is prospectus paper. You know, 34 is people and places. And so 34 certainly is uh, where we find Reg T margin requirements. Uh, disclosure requirements on the 10K, the annual report, yes. It established the SEC. Yeah, President Roosevelt, remember all that legislation was called the New Deal. And a lot of his New Deal friends were upset when we established the SEC and he made Joe Kennedy the first chairman of the SEC. And all his New Deal friends said, how in the world could you put a uh, fox in charge of the hen house and President Roosevelt said, who better as a gamekeeper than a reform poacher? So, you know, uh, by the way, he did a fantastic job. You know, uh, Joe Kitty knew all the games and kind of shut them down, right? So uh, proxy solicitation. Yeah, prior to 1934, uh, we would have shareholder meetings at 11.59 p.m. Alcatraz Island. You had to be present to vote. And if you didn't uh, show up, you know, if you uh, landed at the dock, the thug would say, how are you going to vote? You didn't come up with the right answer, you know, you wouldn't make it to the meeting. So 34 says you don't have to attend the meeting. You can vote by proxy. Uh, broker dealers can't charge customers to forward the proxies. Uh, broker dealers can be reversed from the issuer for doing so. Form four. So form four, you know, I file my uh, form 144. And then, you know, uh, based on that, I say within the next 90 days, uh, I have the intention, perhaps I don't have to, you know, do it, but it gives me ability to sell up to 1% of the outstanding stock or the average of the last four weeks trading volume, whichever is greater. And then form four is what I file when I've done so. And I would know this. So boom. I remember when I was a practitioner, I had to, you know, I used to track this stuff. And this guy said, mean, Dean, it's so, uh, what a coincidence you happen to call me when I'm very liquid. I said, well, I know you're very liquid because the reason I'm calling you is I saw the form four. <laughs> so, illegal insider trading involves those with access to non-public non, uh, non, non -public information. Well, that depends. I mean, whether you've done a trade or not. Right. So, you know, maybe we'll, we'll table that one and see what our other choices are. Uh, those with access to non-public material information. There we go. That's a little better, right? Non-public material. Material is the like one of those pivot words on your exam. Uh, you know, material means something that would alter somebody's decision. So, you know, you're going to you want to be looking for that word material, not just here, like, you know, form ADV or U4s or whatever that uh, word is. So that's a key kind of a word as a test taker. Uh, buying or selling securities based on non-public uh, information, yes. Advising other, yes. Yeah. So two, three, and four. So if you want to stay out of trouble, you say, well, I didn't disclose whatever it is. You know, not just this. You say, because I didn't think it was material. I thought it was in material, in material. Uh, the offering of an interstate securities is uh, regulated by, regulated by, and mutual fund registration is required by. So uh, 33, uh, no. Uh, interstate offerings, remember, are exempt transactions under 33. 
So, you know, that's an interstate offering. Uh, it's not exempt under the Uniform Securities Act. I'm going to have to register the 147 with my state administrator. And whenever we're talking about, uh, you know, the Uniform Securities Act, we're talking about blue sky laws, right? Blue sky laws, you know, that's the state regulatory framework. So uh, it's going to be three. And a mutual fund registration would be the Investment Company Act of 1940. So the answer is going to be three and four. Now, I would definitely know that mutual funds are federally covered securities, meaning we don't have to register the mutual fund under the Uniform Securities Act. So that would be the other thing I would know. Uh, D. An investment advisor is required to give written disclosure to prospective uh, clients. This disclosure includes the advisor's background as contained in Form ADV Part 2. Form ADV Part 2 is, you know, can be used in lieu of a brochure and, you know, it's help you make an informed decision. So uh, within what time frame must the customer, uh, time period must the disclosure be presented to the new customer? Uh, yeah, I would have a general understanding of this. It's going to be uh, B. And, you know, then we're going to tell him if we don't give it to him, if we give it to him, you know, less than that, he has a free look period where he can, you know, get get out of the, the uh, contract. I mean, I'm trying to find my highlighter here. I think that's a good uh, fodder for a uh, poor man's flashcard, that 48 hours. Uh, 39, blue sky laws apply to which of the following investments? So uh, securities, yeah. Do we have to register securities with the uh, blue sky? Again, remember, it means Uniform Securities Act. It looks like our friends at Melmetrics like the word blue sky rather than Uniform Securities Act. But, you know, oh, well, right. It's kind of the same thing. Anyway, so uh, securities, yes. Government bonds, you should know, are exempt issuers under both 33 and blue sky laws, the Uniform Securities Act. So one without two, not kind of helpful. You should definitely know that municipal bonds are exempt issuers under both 33 and the Uniform Securities Act, meaning you don't have to register U.S. government securities and you don't have to register municipal bonds. Uh, REITs are not, and so the answer is one and four. One and four. According to FINRA, FINRA is the self-regulatory organization. Which of the following are considered forms of public communication? A representative's interview on a television or radio show? Absolutely. A rep's participation in a seminar? Absolutely. A representative's Facebook profile? Absolutely. A representative's text message to one or more existing uh, cu customers? Yeah, I mean, uh, one, two, three, and four. Uh, what I would worry about on your exam is actually the firm's written supervisory procedures about how they handle social media, right? So that Facebook profile uh, is testable in terms of is it going to be static or interactive or, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, 41, according to the Security and Exchange Commission, arraignments under which products and services are obtained by an advisor for a broker dealer in exchange for business? This is called soft dollar compensation. It is very testable. So soft dollars. And uh, I would definitely know that broker dealers can't pay for, for the investment advisor, uh, can't pay travel, can't pay rent, can't pay for uh, furniture. They can pay seminar registration fees. They can pay registration, uh, excuse me, research. So yeah, you should expect a question or two on soft dollar compensation paid by a broker dealer to an investment advisory firm for directing transactions to the broker dealer and know uh, what is not allowed. The test is very negative. Uh, selling away is a different thing. Selling away is when an associated person uh, gets somebody involved in an investment not sponsored by the employing broker dealer without permission. And market manipulation is bad and insider trading is bad. 42. Uh, Steve, an associated person, has violated the private securities transaction. I just told you what that is, selling away. Uh, so I get yeah, kind of weird, this Momentrix. They give you, it looks like twosies, right? We get one and then we get another. So um, when sanctioning Steve, which of the following will FINRA consider to determine the extent of uh, to which Steve sold away? 
So now they're asking you the length of the time that he did it. Yeah, the dollar amount of the sales, the number of customers, and whether he encouraged other customers. I think I'm not a big fan of this question, but it's one, two, three, and four. You know, I'm not a big fan of the question. I would definitely know selling away, but I'm not so sure that's the flavor of the actual exam itself. Whoops. Uh, 43. Uh, Bernie has violated insider trading laws and will be subject to penalties. Which statement or statements concerning the possible penalties is true? The amount of the penalty may be determined by the court in light of circumstances and the fact of the violation, uh, certainly. The penalty may not exceed three times the profit gained as a result of the uh, violation. That's true. I, I don't like the phraseology, but I would know it's three times trouble damages. So I make 9 million, they charge me 27 million. I'm supposed to say, gee, there's hardly any profit in it anymore. Uh, let's see, three, the penalty may not exceed three times the amount of loss avoided. So it's actually the profit and the loss, right? So I've avoided the loss by selling it early because they failed the drug trial or whatever. That's true too. Uh, must be equivalent. Well, no, four doesn't fit with one, two, and three, right? So it's one, two, and three. I would also know that the Insider Trading Act is also criminals. That means it's not only write a check, it's also go to jail. Whoop. According, well, like I say, kind of weird, these twosies, right? Here we go with another twosie. According to 34, how long is the statute of limitations for violation of the insider trading laws? I wouldn't worry about 34. I would worry about the Insider Trading Act of 88, which was, was a major you know, update to this. Uh, but that being said, it is uh, the choice for 44 is D, five years from the date of purchase or sale of the security. Yeah, again, you know, it seems like, uh, you know, in terms of my real-time analysis of this practice exam, I wish I had more stuff about the Uniform Securities Act and less stuff about the SEC. Would I like you to know everything? The answer is yes. But given that, you know, the state administrator is the one requiring you to take this test, I wish there would be more on it. A uh, broker dealer requesting registration must fill out an application with the SEC containing all the uh, necessary information documentation. This is called Form BD. So remember, there's Form ADV for investment advisors. And that form ADV is how you register with either the state or the feds, SEC, never both. Broker dealers are going to be registered with the SEC, FINRA, and at least one state, if not more. And this is going to be two and four, which is choice C. And again, I think this is a little bit too much of a regulatory, you know, uh, federal thing than on this exam that I'd like. But, you know, too late now, we're already doing it, so we'll put it up on the channel. Uh, 46. If the SEC finds a broker dealer has uh, provided false or misleading material facts or omitted necessary information, the SEC may do all the following except uh, when we're doing suspensions, it's for uh, 12 months. Again, not a big fan of this. So it's not 18 months. And again, it looks like we're in this. Uh, you know, federal stuff instead of uh, Uniform Securities Act stuff. So, um, you know, what are we going to do? We got three questions left, so we're going to continue to march on. Uh, no associated person may share directly or indirectly in profits or losses. Well, good. Okay, finally, we get something that's, uh, you know, very testable. Uh, by the way, you're only going to get two or three multiples of multiples on your, you know, 66. Uh, but the only person who's going to be allowed to participate in profits or losses of a customer account is an agent of a broker dealer in proportionate capital and principal approval. That's it. Now, that is not going to apply to the immediate family members. So, this is testable. No associated person may share directly or indirectly in the profit or loss in any customer account unless the customer is a close friend or family member. No, there's no, there's no exemption on this in terms of proportionate capital and principal approval. Uh, written approval of the employing member. There we go. Obtains written approval from the customer and then proportionate capital. So two, three, and four. And then remember, this is only for the agent of a broker dealer. This isn't anybody else that can do this. 
And by the way, I know of no firm that's actually going to let you do it. <laughs> so, uh, 48, churning are trades that are excessive in size and frequency. You know, I kind of think of uh, the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said they don't have a definite pornography. They just know it when they see it. And, you know, that's kind of like churning. We know it when we see it. Uh, a broker buys a security for his client. The request of such client, no. The broker buys a security for client, later sells the same security for tax purposes. No, that's taking a loss, harvesting tax losses. We do that every year in December. The broker has discretionary power over client's account and purchase energy on stock. No. Uh, excessively trades the AT&T to generate commissions. There we go. Ding, 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 ding. That is churning. Uh, D. Uh, 49 is very testable. Regulation SP, to protect the privacy of consumers' financial information, the SEC Commission adopted a regulation which places notice requirements and restrictions on a financial institution's ability to disclose non-public personal information about customers. You know, we got to tell customers what we're doing to protect their privacy, and indeed that is called Regulation SP. Uh, P.S., and we're going to use that information for any other purpose than that which it was given us. We need your permission, right? The exception would be if the you know government sends me a subpoena or something. Uh, so the answer is B. Uh, 50, which of the following is true about uh, loaning money to customers? There are no restrictions on associated persons' ability to loan money to customers. Absolutely not. B, special rules apply to an associated person's family members regarding loaning money to clients. That's true. Now, remember, associated person means broker-dealer. So on the investment advisory side, we can't do that. Okay, so I uh, hope you found that helpful. Um, not my, you know, we've done three of these so far. We've, uh, if you follow me through the matriculation, I always joke, I come into your life for a reason and a season. Uh, the reason is to uh, pass your exams and the season is how long it takes you to do that. And as I mentioned, Momentrix has given us permission to, do all the exams. If we did the SIE, you know, that exam was okay. We did the seven, uh, okay. This will be a Thursday premiere. Uh, we have other exams. I think they're a little better in the channel already. We have uh, one from myself. We have one from the test geek. We have one from Kaplan. Now we have one from Mometrics. A little disappointed it's only 50 questions. And the flavor, I wish had more Uniform Securities Act. I'm still going to put it up there. Uh, be interested in your comments and whether you think this is helpful. Uh, I was going to do all of them, but based on this one, I'm not sure I'm going to continue on. But let me know if you found it productive. If so, what that just means is that, you know, we're asking you to inform other, uh, you know, people because then I'll do a 65, one and a six and a 63. Uh, but where I sit right now based on this one is, mm, you know, maybe. All right. Well, remember inch by inch, your 66 is a cinch yard by yard. Your Series 66 is hard. And if you have any lecture requests or any problems with the 66, just uh, let me know. And I'm more than happy to make a little video or another lecture, whatever you might need. Bye-bye.